As if they don't have too much on their plates The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade They'll talk about the things they did that day They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H Rewind the Smackdown Rewind the Smackdown Rewind the Smackdown Rewind the Smackdown Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rewind to SmackDown. I am John Pollock, along with Wei Ting. Welcome to the program. Hello, Wei. H- Hello, John. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Is that a sarcastic answer, or what? No, I'm doing fantastic. Emphasis on the A. Um, no I'm idea. Doing tremendous. That... I'm doing wonderful. Oh. Okay. That's all you have to say, but okay. I don't know if you're trying to hide something. I don't know if this was a, like a code for something that was really bothering you, and this no, was your way of I don't. Me. I don't speak in code. I'm very forthright. That is true. Well, that's good. Hey, yeah. Let's talk about basketball. How are the Raptors going to do in this finals? Uh, they going, you got, you got going a lot to... of time to think this over. I know this is a big deal for you. Well, I believe they will... Um... I don't fucking know, dude. I'm not even a real fan. I'm just a fan when when it means something. And that's this. This is like, you know, like the first time in franchise history they're making the finals. It's huge. When was the last time a Toronto team even made it to the the finals of anything? It must have been the Jays. So this is like... No, our our soccer team. That doesn't count. 2016. Oh, please. Who watches that? I, could, I mean, yeah. The are are you going to go to any of the uh, the Jurassic Park festivities, which they've now extended to Mississauga and Brampton? I did not realize that the, that the Jurassic Park extends all the way to Brampton and Mississauga now. That sounds insane. Uh, You'll love what they're calling it. Uh, they're calling it Jurassic Park West. Yes, of course. Well, uh, you know, as, as I think uh, as fun and as interesting as that may be, uh, I don't think so. I think we're staying far away from the downtown core. I think if I was younger, I would be all over it. Like, I would stand in the cold, even if it was raining. It's like, you know, like, honestly, like, at this point, it feels like it's like a once-in-a-lifetime type of opportunity. Because who knows when a Toronto team will ever win anything again, or even be in contention. So, uh, but but as of now, I, I much prefer the comfort of my own couch. Do you know who the ESPN is sending up here to cover uh to do coverage of the game on Thursday night for game 1? Mike Bond. He lives here, but very close. Oh, Ariel Hawani? Yes. No way. Yeah, he's being sent up here. Wait a second, is he doing basketball now? Well, he he's doing some some pre-game stuff with them. That's amazing. Yes. Wow. Cool. I'm happy so, for him. Yeah. So look at that. Everyone's uh Everyone's on board for this this Raptors run. Um, maybe they'll win it. So are you going to watch? Game one is on Thursday night, so I might actually watch it. This yeah. schedule actually, like, luckily enough, because like, last last uh, uh, series completely conflicted with, like, Mondays and Tuesdays and Saturday with double or nothing. So, uh, But this, this new one is actually kind of good for us because it's, like, a Thursday game, I believe something on Sunday, and then clear until Wednesday. Yeah, that's really good. Sunday, nothing on Monday. Man, they have a lot of gaps here. And then Wednesday. I have a friend that lives in Europe and is making a trip. They got tickets to Game 5 and are coming back. Okay, okay, How much much did they pay? I don't know. I don't know what the price was. I'm sure it was astounding. I've been told, like, the lowest tickets are, like, $900 right now. But here's the deal. Like, they are coming to, like, see family and stuff, so it's not, like, a loss, but... You're buying tickets to game five. There's not even, it'll probably go to five games, but you don't know for sure. Yeah. I'd be so nervous. Like if the Warriors go up three, nothing and you've got this pending trip to come home and maybe you'll go, maybe you won't. Well, think about the people that must, must have tickets to game seven. If they're even selling tickets for game seven yet. Yeah. Yeah. Game five though, to me is like the trickiest one. It's like, man, you're just, you're just rooting for you'd be rooting against the Raptors if they won game one. You just want to guarantee that fifth game. Honestly, I'd be so tempted to like just sculpt those tickets. You can make a killing. Oh off my of god. Them. But I don't I would sell them if I if I somehow came into contact with tickets. I wouldn't need to go and attend. I don't encourage it. Neither do you, John, I'm sure. That's what you're saying. You should try and get in. 
You should go oh. and cover a game for us. Do it on the double shot. Sure. Yeah, my expert analysis of uh, the dribbling and the shooting and the throwing of the balls. Yes. I used to love going to Raptors games. They were my favorite sporting events to attend. I've never been to one um, in the ACC. I went to one actually when it was in the Sky Dome. But do people even want to hear us talk about all this at this point? Oh, I want to go through all the potential matchups. The Kawhi factor. I don't know if you know this, John, Stephen but I'm starting Curry. to put these shows up on our YouTube channel. YouTube.com oh. slash post wrestling. So we're opening up ourselves to a brand new audience and a brand new set of ridicule from our YouTube audience. So hello there, YouTube. We're just going to keep talking about this basketball stuff until we get a bunch of dislikes and negative comments. I get those anyway. So this will be fine for me. I'm, I'm cool with that. You're the one with the pristine reputation. I don't know about that, John. I would say you built up a great deal of goodwill over the past. Uh, over, I've been complimented very much on our work over the past month. You know, between obviously oh. your great Owen Hart documentary as well as our coverage of uh, Double or Nothing, and and all that stuff. And we're here. We are risking it all with our basketball, in depth basketball expertise. Do you know what Double or Nothing almost led me to do on Sunday? I was at a Starbucks, and I nearly. Struck up a conversation with a complete stranger. This is completely out of my realm. I'm waiting in line to buy a coffee, and there's a gentleman sitting at a table, and he is scrolling through Dave Meltzer's Twitter feed. And no way! You I was, saw this. Damn. Well, it was it was very hard not to. I'm just like standing there, and I'm basically right over How his shoulder. Do you see somebody scroll through somebody else's feed. That's such like a small thing. And what did you happen to notice Dave's like not on his phone on this guy's laptop. It was oh. pretty it was not on a phone. So you just happen to to see Dave's avatar. You see the little When you see that avatar, it's like the bat signal. <laughs> like you know that this is Dave Meltzer's Twitter feed and <laughs> uh and then he he like went over and started looking at like other wrestling news and stuff. I'm like the guy clearly clearly watched the show last night. But I was like, no, because if this was the other way around, I'd, I'd probably be like, OK, you're, you're kind of like looking at my laptop. So I, I respect personal space. I went on to uh, order my coffee, which I wanted the medium roast. And Hold on a second. You didn't, felt... you, you didn't make conversation with this guy? No, no. Oh, come on. This guy probably was like, maybe he probably know who you were. He probably he wasn't searching to. my Twitter feed. Well, that's well, that's something to work up towards. How weird would that no, be? I think he had headphones on, too. Like, that's the golden... You don't bother someone with headphones on. Ever, ever, ever. Well, I'm sure he would have really appreciated the conversation, but okay. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You you know Wei Ting? I was like, yes. <laughs> I know Wei Ting. Uh, anyway, so that, that, was, that was it. That was the story. Well, I, 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 I encourage you next time. What would you have said to, to get this guy's attention? I was going to ask him, did you, did you watch Double or Nothing last night? Okay, that's and that great. would have been my uh, great opener. It's like, and then he says yes. And it's like okay, now I got to order my coffee. So that's it. That's such a pessimistic way of looking at it. You could have potentially opened your, up yourself to a brand new insight, brand new analysis. You might have even made a brand new friend, maybe a lifelong well, friend, maybe a future podcast partner. I was also planning to to sit there for a while and, and do some work. And then it's like, you know what? You start the conversation. It's like, now are we obligated to, like, do I sit at the table? Then do we have to, like, continue talking? It's like, eh, too much, too much. Just get my coffee and move on. I really realized, uh, I never uh, realized how much you had in common with Larry David, but you're very much like a <laughs> wrestling podcasting's Larry David. This is what I, this is what goes through my mind, Why? I'm not, I'm not opposed to, uh, conversation but it's more so it's 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 less about me and it's less it's more about the other person what am i imposing on this person i think that's the issue is i think you're always assuming other people don't want to talk to you when you should have you ever listen to any of my interviews way do you know how many times in an interview where i say uh i will just mention like midway through like uh uh just a few more questions here and thank you so much for uh the time here i am completely cognizant of this person, I just imagine every time I'm interviewing someone, they're looking at their watch. That's what I, I that is my biggest struggle. You shouldn't I'm revealing do that. it now. Oh, okay. Is that how you react when you're being interviewed yourself? Sometimes. Okay. That's, oh, it sometimes. depends. But you've had interviews where you just like, you, you want to keep going forever. 
wouldn't you? Oh, there's some. Hey, if it's uh, you, I, I don't. I don't like it's it's the people that you are most Damien. I feel like I genuinely enjoys talking to me. So I've never uh I have that concern. I think those are the best interviews, the ones where uh you have that state of mind that the person wants to be there and 95% of the people probably enjoy uh the conversation. But you always have to be I think courteous of this person's giving you your your their time and for, for nothing on their end other than to be generous. Okay. But I also wonder, you know, like what <laughs> What else do you think Fred Ottman is up to? <laughs> Fred Ottman could be very busy. <laughs> uh, I'm joking, of course. Yes, of course. Of course. Well, uh, what I'm what I'm saying is ninety five percent. You're saying ninety five percent of people enjoy these conversations. What's what's so what's stopping you from engaging that person in Starbucks who will probably fall in that ninety five percent? Yeah, they could have. But again, the the headphones were kind of the tip off for me. That's that's a no go for me. I don't That's interrupt true. people with their headphones on. I hate that. I hate that myself. Well, that is true. Sometimes yeah. sometimes you just want to be in your own space. The guy's alone. He's just enjoying a coffee. He doesn't want to talk about anything. I can respect that. Or It'll be put... hilarious if this person's a listener of ours. Oh, that that will make this awesome. Well, a lot of people listen to Starbucks or start listen to their headphones at Starbucks scrolling through Dave Meltzer's timeline. So Every, there's probably like 80 people listening to this right now. We're like, oh, my God, that was me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, way. If people uh, have the time to do so, what are some shows they can look forward to this week? Go. Well, listen, I, I, I did not mean to slight uh, Miss. Oh, uh, whoa, whoa, is someone busy? The Shockmaster, damn. I, I was going to say, I did not mean to slight uh, uh, Mr. Fred Ottman at all. I'm sure a very busy man. Take especially. that back. He is, he is maybe the nicest person yes. I've ever spoken to. He was just, like, the, just the first person. Such a came, nice individual. He was just the first person that came to mind. And I, I also think he's probably somebody who really enjoyed your conversation with him. That, of course, is up right now on our feed. If you just scroll back down, that was released on Sunday. Uh, as well, uh, uh, many other interviews that John has conducted uh, for um, uh, in recent weeks, uh, specifically for the uh, Owen Hart's final day post profile, uh, those continue to be uploaded to our Post Wrestling Cafe feed. And the next one is Jason King. That one will be up Wednesday afternoon. So you can check out the Jimmy Corderas one now. Uh, Jason King Wednesday, Heath McCoy on Sunday, and then the rest will be out next week, uh, which are Paul Lazenby, Jeff Merrick, and Trey Lindstrom. Uh, They'll all be out over the next uh, little bit for members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. So you sign up for that, you will get all of the bonus interviews. The Post Wrestling Cafe. I do recommend. Yes, the Post Wrestling Cafe, of course, for uh, it it is what we call our Patreon. It is uh, the source of our our life. Um, And if you enjoy any of our shows, consider supporting us for as little as $6 a month. Wednesday, the British Wrestling Experience is back for their latest show, uh, the Double Shot returns with John and I talking a great deal about StarCast. That, of course, is also on the Post Wrestling Cafe feed as well. Also on Wednesday evening, one more shout out to our friends Braden and Davey who are hosting a TakeOver Watch Along. They will be rewatching the very first NXT TakeOver. So uh, follow. Didn't they try this once before? Yes, I think. And that was to uh, somewhat um, um, maybe mixed, mixed results. reviews. No, okay. I mean, I, I, from what it sounds like, it sounds like they. They had some very last minute kind of technical things that kind of screwed them over. Perhaps not not their fault. But anyway, uh, this is instead of takeover. This is called uh, up next do over. Sure. You can call it that. I'm just I have no doubt this one will be amazing. And uh, you can find them on the BDE's YouTube channel. So look up BDE official. Uh, But those guys are back again. They'll be working really hard because not only will they be watching takeover that evening, they'll also be catching up with that on tomorrow's edition of NXT. So Thursday, that will be the show that they will be reviewing on their feed up next. We have the Cafe Hangout coming out for our Double Double Plus patrons also on Thursday. Um, Do you you have anything to announce? For Thursday? Um, For the Hangout. No, we're going to have Damian Abraham on the show for sure and maybe another guest. Uh, well, to be determined. Well, even even if there's no other guest, I think um, there will be plenty of people who probably want to call in and talk about the, the, the very interesting week in wrestling. So always look forward to that, especially for all of you who have recently signed up to our Double Double Level. Come join us at 3 o'clock Eastern on Thursday for our live cafe hangout. If you can't do that, the archive will be released publicly to everybody on Friday afternoon. And then Friday as well, Friday morning, we have our latest 
rewind away this time. Oh my god. Talking about Thunder in Paradise. You started this thing? Fucking hate it. It's terrible. I don't know how I'm going to finish this by Thursday. It's an It's like, really like tough. 90 minutes. Dude, it's an hour and 45 minutes. Oh my god. Well, listen, 1.25 times the speed and I'm thinking of increasing to 1.5. <laughs> I really don't dread like watching these bad movies that much because I feel like I watch the equivalent of like a a bad three hour movie most weeks. No way, no way. Oh, I'll, I'll watch five really? Raws before I ever want to watch this movie again in my life. Wow. Okay. I look forward to your the, the, it, Raw is so much better than this movie. Well, I look forward to to talking with you about this. This that that of course is out on on Friday, um, and then on Saturday, big day for us here at Post Wrestling. We have the debut of W H Park's brand new. G1 retrospective show. He will be reviewing every G1 Climax final, starting with 1991. John Pollock guest hosts on this very first edition. That's every Saturday and Sunday. Cruel Summer. Be on the lookout for that. That's going to take us all throughout. All 20-something, uh, eight G1s. All of them will be covered. And then also... My summer is set. Every Saturday, Sunday morning. Listen to WH in my ears. To cancel your plane ticket. Cancel your hotel to... Florida, whatever you're going to do, this is your summer vacation. This is your holiday. You get tanned listening to Cruel Summer from WH Park. And then Wednesday or Sunday night, uh, Up Next is back with their review of TakeOver 25. Saturday night. Oh, Saturday, whatever. Sure. Lots of stuff to look forward to. All right, postwrestling.com, postwrestlingcafe.com. What a value. Wonderful. Lots of news to get into. Uh, I'm going to start off with some uh, some news that I was able to uh, to gather today regarding uh, Double or Nothing uh, and some stats coming out of uh, Fight TV. So uh, for those that uh, watched it, you will remember that for All In, uh, Fight TV was able to uh, be the digital home of All In for all uh, the territories, including the U.S., this time around, with the BR Live deal, they did not have the rights to make it available in the U.S. So uh, what I was told is that they did not do as many uh, digital buys as All In, but they were not that far off. And when you consider the fact that the U.S. is removed from this, like what would you guess, Way, would be like the percentage of buys that would come from the U.S.? I would definitely say over 50 Um I'm going to guess, I don't know, 75. Well, if you think it, like, I don't know what the percentage was for the, the last I, show. I, you know, I, I'm only going with, like, even our own fan base is just, just as sort of like a, like, like any type of, you know, uh, marker. Because, like, half of our audience is from the U.S. And we're Canadian based. So I have, I'm not really sure. Like, I'm just trying to gauge what the wrestling audience exists, where they exist. But it, uh, I, I would say definitely at least 50. Yeah, so um, if it if it were to be fifty percent, then it would have blown away the all in number. Um, so it it was a very good number. And an interesting thing that uh, I was told today is that after a wrestling pay per view, like I guess a notable wrestling show that Fight hosts, they'll sometimes do up to twenty percent on the replay buys. Whereas something like boxing, they do nothing after those cards air. And it's kind of an interesting thing that's mm -hmm. unique to pro wrestling that there is a high curiosity to go back. And as much as we talk about pro wrestling um, and having more of a sports-like presentation, this might be an interesting argument that because it is this kind of amalgamation of sport and also story and, you know, yeah. the many different things that draw you in, that it does have uh, more of a... Um, of a replay factor that several days after you're willing to go back. Whereas in boxing, and I would assume it's similar for MMA, so much is wrapped up in the result and mm -hmm. not so much the, the story of, you know, the show. And I think that's kind of interesting. That's something that's a bit of a positive for pro wrestling. Definitely. I mean, do you think it's a positive or can it be, can you consider it potentially a negative? Um, if you're looking to promote pro wrestling as sort of this DVR proof entity, um, Certainly, like, I'm just, you know, hate to go back to our expert basketball analysis, but I, I mean, you know, watching a Raptors game after the fact, like, by myself on DVR is just not the same. Like, you know, with many sports, including boxing or including MMA, you just simply know the results immediately. You, you prefer watching with a group, whereas wrestling, 
I mean, it's kind of like half Game of Thrones, half, you know, um, sports. And, and often, I think watching it by yourself afterwards is almost just as fun as watching with other people. But, you know, it, in this instance, it's certainly a positive. But can it also be construed as a negative? Yeah, I think you can I think you can argue both ways that when it came to the television deals WWE got last year, a, a big part of it was trying to push the fact that we are relatively DVR proof and positioning ourselves as part of the live sports bubble that's going to acquire all of this. But then you also have something where you are less when the result means less and people are and especially fight is going to be drawing from a much more hardcore wrestling base than maybe are tuning into the USA network, but there is more of a desire to go back and watch something, even if you know the results. Like, you may hear that, mm -hmm. well, Kento Miyahara defeated Shuji Ishikawa, but if you hear it's a four-and-a-half-star match, you want to go back and watch that as opposed to uh, maybe a fight where so much is just simply the result. That yeah. I think more and more wrestling has got away from the result meaning as much, and there's, there's good and bad to it. Why aren't we rating basketball games according to a five-star scale? Uh, because that would be very difficult to do. It's well, not a cooperative we're, sport. We're, we're rating it based on excitement. Well, pro wrestling is more like so that, of like a, that, like the the Kawhi like uh, four bounce thing. That game, that game seven, that's definitely a five star with a great finish. Uh, just getting back to to the fight TV stats, the top five markets uh, to buy the show, uh, and remember the U.S. of course is not part of this. Number one was the U.K. and Ireland, which is interesting because it was available in the U.K. on ITV box office. And given the time slot, I think that's um, interesting. Number two was Australia. Number three was Germany, followed by Canada. And fifth was Japan. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Canada. So, wait, come um, on. Come on, guys. We got to do better than that. What are we? Well, and four? I mean, in Canada as well, like it was available on Shaw. It was available on Viewer's Choice. I believe it was on Bell as well. So there was a lot of options to buy it on traditional pay-per-view beyond Fight TV. So... I see. Um, anyway, interesting stats there. Yeah. Uh, from Double or Nothing. We do have other uh, All Elite Wrestling news. In fact, this news was uh, just released that for Fighter Fest, it is going to be John Moxley versus Joey Janela. Oh, okay, they're having the match rather than teaming up. Wow. Yes. Um, tickets are going on sale. May 29th, which is tomorrow, today by the time most are listening to this on Wednesday. And, yeah, they've announced Moxley versus Janela uh, as part of Fighter Fest in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I think Wise holding off the Kenny Omega match till uh, that should be all out, I think. Absolutely. I mean, but, you know, to somebody who knows Joey Janela and maybe has followed Joey Janela, this actually feels like it's a rather big match. I don't know how much it means to, you know, like your last WWE fan who might not know that much about Joey Janela or know of him at all. But um, the, 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 the kind of similarity of the two, two characters um, should be really interesting to see. Um, but, you know, all signs point to Moxley really just kind of like running over Joey Janela because it's his first AEW match. Uh, they've also announced the signing of Sadie Gibbs, and Luchasaurus, as well, has been signed by All Elite Wrestling. And I'm sure some of that was contingent on his performance on the weekend. I thought he was one of the standouts of the Battle Royal. Yes, yes, yes. Sadie Gibbs, they played a little uh, vignette for on the pre-show. That's right. Yeah, she had been known for some time. Today was just the official announcement. And as well, following our conversation from Monday night, Juice Robinson, John Moxley will be happening at the finals of the Best of the Super Juniors next Wednesday from Sumo Hall for the United States title. So really, not... really interesting that that it's not happening at Dominion and leaves you wondering if they will have Moxley on a different match at, at Dominion if he'll be appearing at all. Yeah, that'll be interesting. They could throw him into a tag or do something if he's over there. Um, you know, they were always pushing the June fifth date, and it, it may just simply have been that that's the show that kind of needs a bump when it comes to. Uh, ticket sales as opposed to Dominion that has been pretty solid so far as well. But yeah, it'll be interesting if Moxley gets on the Dominion card as well, which would seem to make sense. I really have to recommend the uh, press conference that they New Japan did to announce uh, the match with uh, Juice Robinson, basically, you know, talking about his motivations 
four facing John Moxley. And it was great because it was Juice talking all about their history together in, in FCW um, when they were both in developmental and he was just essentially a young boy. And Dean Ambrose by that point was, you know, somebody to be res- respected. Um, he great, he just like makes great use of like real life history to build this match up. When you think on the surface, D, uh, John Moxley and, and Juice Robinson, what could they have possibly in common? But like after, after seeing this press conference, like you totally understand this rather lengthy backstory that these two had. And the final all elite wrestling note is a uh, bleacher report live is listing Fighter Fest and Fight for the Fallen, but there's no price tag attached to it. Given that it seems like this pay per view did very well commercially, what do you see the price point being for these two shows? They do you do you have them less, or do you come out and just price these alongside and say that these are big shows? I think they could get away with fifty dollars for double or nothing. You could probably get away with fifty dollars for all in because I think on paper those cards were really stacked. But you know, just even listening to Cody talk about talk about it briefly in his uh, post post fight press conference. Am I really calling it that post show press conference? Sure. Sure. Um, it, you know, he, he says he recognizes these shows are $50 and they probably don't want to, you know, exhaust their audience by doing them every single month. Um, I, I also, he also, I believe mentioned not every show is going to be five hours long. I imagine these two coming up will be kind of some of their lesser shows, B level shows, if you will. Uh, and therefore, I can't see them justifying charging fifty dollars. Maybe, maybe maybe thirty five. Yeah, that sounds fair. Sounds fair to me. Sure. I I I think that there would be some negativity to it. I I think they feel so hot right now that if I think people ultimately they want to see these shows, especially when you consider that they're going to promote these as big shows. As the fight for the fallen show, you've got. Cody and Dustin against the Bucks, and you've got Chris Jericho on that show. That I think when push comes to shove, people are going to buy these shows. Um, are they? Are, but I also understand that that's also kind of a they know that even if we price these at fifty, yes, we'll do well. But this is also some goodwill to our audience as well if we put these at thirty five, for instance. And let's also remember those two shows are only two weeks apart from one another. Yes, good and, point. And therefore, I I can see them not. Uh, wanting to exhaust their audience that way. You're also, even though you're getting like some, you know, big appearances from from the likes of Jericho and, and John Moxley, they're not necessarily like marquee matches. You know, they're not for titles. They're not like on the level of, I would say, a Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega type of, you know, marquee WrestleMania level type of match. They're just more so appearances from these guys that you'd probably get anyway in their upcoming TV show. Um, I personally can't see them charging that much for it, $50, but 35, perhaps I would say 30, 35, that range. And we also had uh, Roman Reigns recently did this interview with Newsweek and he was asked about going to Saudi Arabia next week. And this was his response to the show. He said, it gets a lot of mixed and negative reactions. The bottom line for me is if we're going to help promote change, if we're going to set out to make an impact, then I have to be a part of it. I'm not going to sit on the sideline and talk about how we can get there. I want to be part of the action. I look at it as being a part of the solution while still respecting cultures. But it's a big world, and I want to experience all of it. So if we can help make a positive impact, that's what we're here to do. We're here to put smiles on everyone's faces. We don't discriminate. That's our goal to help and promote positivity and take that to every inch of the world. I mean, it's the same company line you've heard anybody, you know, who's been interviewed while employed speak. Um same thing with like Rhonda. It's the same answer. And I don't really fault Roman. I mean, I don't know what his personal views are. This could very well be what he truly believes, but I wouldn't expect any type of controversial response from him from, you know, the face. No, of the no one's going to be like, it's very clear. Like no one is going to speak out publicly. Uh, like I don't, I don't expect a Daniel Bryan to talk about it. I don't expect Sami Zayn to. Um, I think it would be interesting if, if the question were posed to them in a public setting uh, but, you know, you can state, though, we don't discriminate, but you are actively working with people that do, that do discriminate. Well, absolutely. I mean, I'm always curious to know how much follow up there is with responses like that and how Roman Reigns would respond to perhaps an accusation like that uh, if if pressed. Um, 
but listen, what I feel bad for these guys actually. Like what they're, what they're put in very difficult positions, but at the end of the yeah. day, they're also put out there as representatives of the company. So they have mm-hmm. to be prepared for questions like this. But the natural follow up is what what are you guys doing to invoke change in this part of the world beyond going there, hosting a wrestling show? And making a boatload of money every time you go over there. Well, that's obviously the thing that's not stated is, you know, aside from uh, supposedly wanting to go there to promote change and put smiles on people's faces, you're also collecting a huge, huge, huge paycheck from perhaps, you know, less than morally u- upright sources. So absolutely, it's it's a bit of a conundrum. But it's Roman Reigns. You, you definitely know that, you know, he's... He knows what the corporate line is. Do you want to talk at all about how uh, we're going to be doing our show that day? Um. Yeah. So after we'll, Super Showdown. Yeah, we'll be covering it. Uh, we're not really going to, you know, do the the charity thing again this for this particular show. But what we are going to do is we're looking to have a number of, of uh, interviews, a number of experts, it, basically talk to us about what's going on in Saudi Arabia, Arabia right now. Uh, what's going on in Yemen right now, uh, just basically to, to kind of catch us up and also to even educate us on perhaps a lot of the issues that we didn't even get to talk about on the on the last Crown Jewel show. Um, you know, John and I, like, we, we, we debate heavily about, like, what we should be doing with these uh, reviews. I mean, p- part of us, like, just doesn't want to talk about them at all, but we also don't know if that's the best solution here to just simply ignore it. I think what we've kind of come to an agreement with is just simply using this a- as another opportunity to try to educate ourselves and also our audience about the reality of what's going on there right now. Yeah, so that's how we're going to be assessing the show next week, which is on the Friday, uh, Friday afternoon. All right, uh, all your news you can go grab at postwrestling.com, and we're going to go into our SmackDown review from Tuesday night in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kevin Owens was out at the start. And we recap the the long feud between Kofi Kingston and Kevin Owens. And we returned. Owens was, had the microphone and was going to start off the show with the Kevin Owens show. But Oklahoma is not worthy of it. And the Kevin Owens show with Dolph Ziggler that was announced this afternoon was scrapped. Why announce anything? I don't know. It's not <laughs> like it's a hook. No. Um, I don't know, but it tells you like the... The pace of which stuff changes that this was announced. This wasn't even announced Monday night. It was announced Tuesday afternoon that this would be part of the show. And by showtime, like five, six hours later, it was cut from the show. Yeah, that's crazy. (laughs) Did we even have Ziggler on this show? Did he show up at all? He was showing backstage watching on the monitor. That was it. Oh, okay. Okay. I, that was I, it. That was forget. our whole involvement of Dolph Ziggler, our number one contender on this show. So he then denies attacking Big E and believes that Big E sweats profusely and also tweets a lot. So he may have got distracted. He's a good person. He would never do something like that. And he says he's going to beat Kofi tonight. And therefore, Ziggler will be able to beat Kofi for the title and then owe him a title match. And what was so weird about this is that Owens is in the middle of his promo. And then Tom Phillips talks over him, saying, when are we going to get to the match? And as Owens continues, Kofi's music starts. It seemed like they were legitimately rushing him, and I cannot imagine Tom Phillips acting on his own, interrupting a guy in the middle of his promo. Possibly, yeah. I mean, do we? could it be that they, they intended to cut him off anyway? It just seems strange that it was it would be one thing for just the music to cut him off. Like that's a typical babyface thing to do. Right. But the fact that you had Tom Phillips like pretty much insinuating like this guy's just droning on and on with his promo almost felt like they were just he was taking too long or something like that. And that was, you know, just Tom Phillips being someone's mouthpiece. Yeah, perhaps. Sure. Kingston calls him a liar. He is not a good person. And he unfortunately had to deliver the tongue twister that was talking about Big E's knee. Say that three times fast. Big E's knee, Big E's knee, Big E's knee. Okay, maybe it's not that hard. He says tonight Kevin will pay, and he's going to leave with a clear understanding of why he is the WWE champion. 
Um, you know, I think Kofi tried really hard to sound like he wanted to get revenge for Big E. I usually don't have a problem with him coming out with the pancakes, but I thought it really took away from like the seriousness of this particular promo. Like if you're out here wanting to get revenge for your friend, I think you can lose the pancakes for this one. Yeah, I think it's something that they clearly do not want to move him away from the New Day persona. But I think, yeah, I think you can be selective with the pancakes. I'm not saying you have to make this this uh, rigid uh, breakaway from it. But yeah, in this situation where he's coming out for revenge on Big E and cutting a serious promo, I don't know why they insist that he's still got to do the the mid-card entrance. Hmm. Well, they have all these pancakes. They've got the pancake budget every single week, right? What are you going to do with all these extra pancakes? Eat them. Who's going to eat that backstage? Um, well, you could have you could have done another cookout. Maybe a cornhole game with pancakes. There you go. Perfect. Right. Kofi and Kevin Owens non-title match. They went through two segments. Uh, Kingston had his neck snapped on the top rope. That gave Owens the advantage. Uh, after one commercial, we had Kofi dive over the top with a trust fall. Back into the ring, Kofi blocked a stunner, hit an SOS for a two count, and then Kingston got shoved off the top to the floor. That was our second commercial break. Kingston was down on the floor, beat a uh, count into the ring, took a frog splash, kicked out of that. Then Owens headbutted him off the turnbuckle, hit a swanton for another two count, and then Kingston avoided the pop-up powerbomb, moved and sent Kevin Owens bouncing off the ropes, and as he bounced off, hit the trouble in paradise, and Kingston pinned him. I, I really liked the finish, and I thought these two had a pretty good match here at the start. I thought the last three minutes were fun. You know, all, The rest of it, to me, just kind of felt like your standard WWE template match um, with commercial breaks in between. I'm sure like probably robbing a great deal of that energy. And the commercial breaks, I'm really curious to see when AEW starts doing their TV, how they handle something like that, because... They won't be doing commercial breaks. Oh, they said no commercials at all? Well, they haven't flat out said that. Uh, Jim Ross, though, like, you can see that is, a, like, a big thing for him, is not having commercial breaks, and I would be pretty confident that they are not going to have commercial breaks. What? So what's Or at least very limited. Like a two-hour straight through? No, just not in the middle of a match. Okay, so no commercial breaks in the middle of a, of a match. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, obviously, there will be commercial breaks in the show. I'm saying not breaking up a match with a right. commercial. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm really curious to see how, how they do that because, I mean, they are a necessary evil when you're making a television show. They are the whole point of uh, making a television show is to sell commercials. So how are they going to get by that uh, while still, you know, giving what the audience that what they want? And that's long, thorough matches. Um, I, I think you can be... Uh, creative, like the opening segment every week, like that goes 15 minutes or so without a break. And, you know, I watch other shows like Impact. It's very rare that there's a commercial break during a match. I think it can be done. Um, hmm. But yeah. it's it's something that it, it is, it's not the exception in WWE. It's the rule that you pretty much, any match that's going past six minutes, it's getting a break in there. And it really, I think we're just so used to it. I think it has a real impact on on the match when you're cutting out three minutes and just breaking the flow, and then you have to come back and reset. I think it's been clear that the WWE's concern is not necessarily whether or not a match is perceived as good, um, you know, or or if it re receives receives a certain star rating by the end of the evening. I think what they care about is to make sure that their stars are, are on their TV throughout most of the product, and doing it this way, I guess, assures that you have. Roman Reigns on TV throughout most commercial breaks. Kofi Kingston is a, is has his face across three three segments. It feels like they just design their shows very much for those reasons, rather than you know maybe what makes for the best viewing experience. As we said, Ziggler was watching in the back, but that was it. There was nothing with him and Kofi. It was just Kofi. Uh, it was Ziggler standing watching a television monitor. So exciting. R-Truth and Carmella were running backstage. R-Truth referred to it as the European title and said people are even trying to pin him at the dentist's office. And they went and hid in a room as Drake Maverick was hanging up wanted posters searching for R-Truth. Yeah, so he's a, a 205 guy, so he can 
be on both shows. Is that right? Yeah, we got a bunch of 205 Live guys on this show. So I guess that... Um, well, we, we heard that the, two of, the, the wild card rule applies to all of the brands. So we, we destroyed the number four tonight when you consider that we had uh, Aria Davari running Wait, in. Are you, are you sure about that? Yeah, right at the beginning, they said the wild card applies to 205 Live, NXT, NXT UK. No, no, that was just Foley saying that. that, that was, he said that about the 24-7 title. Oh, was that not for the wild card? You're right. I'm I'm mixing up my my brand listings. Oh, how could right. you? It's clear as day. So, right. So 205 Live uh, are allowed to chase for the 24-7 title, but that's the only invite they get onto SmackDown or Raw. Yeah. By the way, I don't... Even though they were on Raw at a time, and we just stopped doing that. I don't know, dude. Um... Tell me you were keeping count today of the uh, raw talent. Nope. Nope. Because I, I was, try. and for the life of me... It was over four, wasn't it? No. Or was it under? You guessed two yesterday, like in jest, and I think you were right by the end of the evening. Because I couldn't count more than two SmackDown people. Well, I could be wrong, but... Yeah. Let, let's take a minute to look at this, okay? Okay. So, Lacey Evans. Yeah. What show is Jinder Mahal on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Jinder Mahal. Uh, SmackDown. Drew McIn. He's on SmackDown. Okay. Drew McIntyre is a Raw guy, so that's two. Was that it? I mean, that's all I could count. Unless I was uh, uh, missing somebody. Yeah, I think you might have been right. No, you were right. You guessed this. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh. Well, great. I'm a genius. <laughs> well, they, hey, they said up to four, so you can't get upset about two. Oh, they okay. they under-delivered de tonight. They gave Becky a night off. I didn't realize it was up to four. Okay, sure. Who cares? Um, What are... Okay. I, I'm just going to go through every name here and not be sure who is on which show. Way, if you add up the WWE's followers on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, there's over a billion followers. Over a billion followers. That means, that means, Way, that 98,200,000 don't subscribe to the WWE Network. Well, that's, wow. It also means like one-seventh of the planet follows the WWE. And that's when when are we going to get that stat? Yeah. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Yeah. Like imagine I, if, I'm all, it's it's also amazing that there's no crossover either between these four social media outlets. Yeah, it's such bullshit, but um I and, mean and no crossover either from a Roman Reigns follower on Twitter and a Roman Reigns follower on Instagram. Those are separate people, too. Well, we all know you can only choose one. You can only choose one wrestler to follow, and you can only choose one platform with which to follow said wrestler. There's no wild card rule on social media. Yeah. You're brand specific. Mm -hmm. Daniel Bryan and Rowan came out for an interview with Kayla Braxton. Bryan calls the tag division a bad joke. Not wrong. No one booed this. So they told a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? The SmackDown Tag Division. The SmackDown Tag Division who? Exactly. If it wasn't for Daniel Bryan selling this joke, oh, crickets. I, I thought it was Rowan who really made it, you know? Um, I thought Bryan was pretty funny. They're, they're great together. And you know what? Uh, we haven't heard Eric Rowan speak much in this uh, current tag team. If his sole job is to tell jokes, like... <laughs> Bad jokes with zero punchline. I think that's great. I hope they run with it. I think Eric Rowan's fake laugh is great. Why not? That should be. He does the knock knock joke every week. And then when they say. Blah, blah, who he punches you in the face. And that's his finish. No, the no, 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 no. This should be knock knock. Who's there? 
Eric Rowan, and I'm going to knock your brains out. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Brian explains, we are not jokes. <laughs> Though they would be great jokes. They have ambition and purpose and blames the people for stuffing their faces on Memorial Day and eating a hyper-intelligent pig named Wiggles and a nurturing cow named Wilbur. I just like that Daniel Bryan, uh, a father of a young child, worked in a Wiggles reference. Oh, is that, is, that, is that what they are? The Wiggles? Are you familiar with the Wiggles? I've got no clue. Oh, man. Have you ever done the propeller? Please show me. That's a video. <laughs> Wait, the my if you could open up my brain, it would just be every wiggle song on a loop. So these I know are every one of these songs. Okay, so is there a cow named Wilbur in the Wiggles or or what? No, no, no. The the group is called the Wiggles. Oh. It's a group of four four children's actors that are quite the singers. What's your favorite? What's the best Wiggles uh, uh jam? Um, the best Wiggles bop. Uh, the propeller song's not bad. Uh, none of these are good. None of them are good. They're just tolerable, and it's different degrees of tolerable depending on your mood that morning. I'm gonna give it a listen. Okay, we'll we'll review a, a Wiggles episode one day. He also mentioned a nurturing cow named Wilbur, and. Said the people of Oklahoma are worse than anybody because they are the leader in hydraulic fracturing, otherwise known as fracking. They're the leader in deep oil well drilling, which brings them lots of money and lots of earthquakes. How about your earthquakes? <laughs> which was maybe uh, the best uh, question posed to an audience in 2019. Um, Man, I, like he said all this, and at some point, I just felt like it stopped being having anything to do with tag team wrestling. And it was just more so Brian Danielson, the human being, using his platform to like spread his message about fracking and deep oil drilling causing earthquakes to a mass audience. Um, and it works. I, t I now totally know disagree. This was all about tag team wrestling. He listened to my interview on Sunday and remembered the natural disasters and was inspired here to do a promo about earthquakes. Sure. Okay. Well, if he worked it in that way, I, I could accept it. But here, it just like it would seem like he really kind of joined it together in the loosest of ways. He's like, "We're about saving the environment, and we're about saving the tag team division." Like, okay, I guess those two things are somewhat related. But I, I mean, I don't mind it at all. I love hearing like this type of education from Daniel Bryan. Now I know what fracking is. Now I know that Oklahoma's deep oil drilling is the cause of earthquakes. Maybe next week he'll get out on his platform and say, this Friday, I'm giving myself the day off. Damn. You know why? Because I'm not going in on a plane. <laughs> no. Man, I would love like a daily show type of thing with Daniel Bryan. Yeah. Be so you cool. could have a great segment with Daniel Bryan. Well, he says that they are here to save the tag division and the planet. They anoint themselves the planet's tag team champions. And then Kayla reveals there is a team that wants to challenge them, which leads to heavy machinery coming out. And Tucker says they need to get down to some solid blue-collar business, and that's going for the tag titles. And a referee runs in. Brian accepts, but not in this fracking state of Oklahoma. Which, to me, uh, maybe he can get a segment on The Daily Show. He can also now have a line for this week in unnecessary censorship by calling this fracking state of Oklahoma. Well, I was disappointed he didn't tell Oklahoma to go frack themselves. I thought that wrote itself. That would be a great t-shirt. So this Usos match is never happening. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 it wasn't meant to be anything. <laughs> These guys cool. lost for no reason at Money in the Bank that I'm aware of. 50-50. That's it. This tag division is a joke. It, that's the key to being tag champions. You can lose as many times as you want. There's no penalty for it. Certainly that's the case with the, the women's tag division. I mean, it's not... Uh, even with the men's, actually. Sure. Yeah. Like, when was the last time you saw Ryder and Hawkins? Oh, my God. They're the tag champions, aren't they? Yeah. 
Yeah, they're not even on TV. Yeah. Well, hey. maybe this will be what stomping grounds, or do you think this will be on TV? Uh, this match, I think it'll be next week on TV. I don't think it's big enough for stomping grounds. That's going to be the problem with this Daniel Bryan Rowan team is just the lack of competition. You know, I guess Rusev and Nakamura are up there, but you haven't seen them in like feels like months now. Um, so they have to reheat them. But beyond the Usos, there are really no compelling challengers for Rowan and, and uh, uh, Brian. It's going to be interesting to compare one of many comparisons that, you know, AEW with a fraction of the time, look at all the teams they have. And it'll be interesting to watch how they handle a division that is just bursting with tag teams. Uh, but I mean, look and at- then you look here that there's just like they can't even work all the teams on here. It's I mean, you don't you you, you can just. Like like in many cases, when we, when we make these comparisons, you can just look towards NXT, and they're a very healthy tag team division. Um, less TV time, even. So it's, I don't, I again, it's just one of many issues that I think they're going through. Mandy Rose is on the cover of Muscle and Fitness Hers, and DeVille and Rose are in the back handing out copies, and they hand them to the Iconics. They hand a pair to two production guys, and then they run up to Ember Moon, and they ask her, what are you reading? And she's reading Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And DeVille says, spoiler, they all die, and throw magazines at her and leave. Dr. Ah. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Well, is she hinting at something? I mean, is which which one is Ember? Is she Jekyll or Hyde? Well, maybe she's gonna be she's gonna have a dual personality moving forward. So, which one is she right now? I don't know why. Okay. I would I would suggest the latter because after this segment, I would want to hide. Maybe she'll be the librarian. She just like shows up with a different book every week. Yeah, you could do Ember Moon's book club. Okay. I'm I, I'm just I'm disappointed because this is Ember Moon. She's a great wrestler. Um, we'll see where this leads. Probably nowhere, actually. Andy Rose and Carmella. Uh, Rose is holding up her magazine. Carmella kicks it away, and Deville is then holding up the magazine on the floor. They're really pushing this damn thing. There was a flying knee from Rose that got a two count. Deville then distracted her on the apron. Awkward sidekick that Rose ducked and stack Carmella for the win at three minutes and eight seconds. Yeah, she won via magazine distraction. <laughs> so I guess it's great publicity for this magazine. But but is it, you know, like, wouldn't you rather tell people what was inside the magazine? Like, it'd be nice to know what what is in the the words. Muscle I and fitness. I understand she gives out, like, workout tips. I'd I'd love to know her, her workout tips. Like I I well, now you've got to go buy the magazine. Success, but, but there's no even tease of like you know like hey these are the contents of this magazine that you want me to pay ten dollars for. But whatever, it's fine. Jinder Mahal was in the back fighting our truth. Sent him into a room and then our truth hid in a photo booth, and then the idiots ran past missing him, which featured the B team. What show are they on? I'm going to say SmackDown because they helped Shane okay. that one time. Right, right. Matt Hardy, SmackDown, Akira Tozawa, Noam Dar, Apollo Crews, and Arya Davari all ran after him. And then Truth popped out and Drake Maverick, who at least I'm really stretching here. This little attention to detail, he's always been the slowest one at the end. And he's the one who crashes into R-Truth after R-Truth thinks everyone has ran by. And then Maverick, all his his wanted posters get thrown up in the air. And as he's going to pick them up, realizes it's R-Truth. But he doesn't escape with anything here. The chase is on. This is a whole eight-day build with this slow Drake Maverick finally getting a shot. Um, you remind me that like Akira Tozawa and, and Apollo Crews are backstage together, probably just like hanging out and catering, doing nothing. And I've always remember wanted... when we were in Dragon Gate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I've always wanted those two to just like make a team together and brought SmackDown needs tag teams. Why not put those guys together? 
no time, boy. No time for this. It was, we'll talk about this more on the double shot, but hearing Dustin Rhodes just talk about the culture of just being in the back and just having nothing to do is just demoralizing for these guys as they're just watching their time tick away and they're just getting older by the month, by the year, and just watching their careers just on hold. Well, I mean, like Akira they- Tozawa is like, he's fantastic. He's yeah. fucking fantastic. And I don't think you would have a clue if you were a WWE viewer for the last two years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, didn't you see his performance tonight? The way he ran after uh, the whole group, John? I mean, couldn't you tell his athleticism from that? He's a great runner. Yep. Alistair Black. He goes to talk about, you know, doing his uh, his typical promo and then cuts himself off and just looks at the camera. Look, I get it. You're waiting for me to throw out a name to pick a fight with somebody. Well, I'm sitting here waiting patiently for somebody, anybody, to pick a fight with me. Yeah, I mean, obviously they were up against uh, maybe some uh, un, you know unforeseen circumstances with the whole tattoo thing, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so I guess this was just their way of telling you, hey, um, we know you've been waiting for him to make a debut. He's not going to yet, but after this show, we promise. He'll be out. He's better off not being in that 50-man battle royal. Oh, for sure. At the same time, though, I don't understand why you couldn't have just had him come out here and beat guys, like any guy from the back. That's you know, what I'd be doing with him. Yeah, the same way you've had Lars show up and just, like, he hasn't had a match or anything. It's just, like, coming out and just kicking the shit out of people. Just give me, like, great showcases for Aleister Black, even if he doesn't have a pay-per-view match coming up. Like, you do that Black Mass for four weeks in a row, this guy's going to be... Really red hot, I think. Yeah. That's an awesome finish. He can do tons. It's like just his strikes. They're phenomenal to watch. This guy's got a very unique charisma about him. Um, Not to say like the promos are bad. I think he's doing a very good job with them at times with like trying material. They are getting Uh, to be a little too pretentious though. Well, this week I thought was an acknowledgement of that, that we have kind of reached the limit of these and the next step is necessary because you don't want this guy to... Turn into Bray Wyatt. Yeah. Pre-Funhouse. Him in the Funhouse. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Sure. Shane McMahon is out for Shane McMahon Appreciation Night with Elias and Drew McIntyre. And we have the trophy out. Greg Hamilton does his introduction. And then Shane throws to his custom-made career highlight video outlining the past two decades of this man. Produced by Kevin Dunn. Yes, who got a shout-out by Shane. Yeah, He says that Reigns and his family have had food placed on their table by the McMahons for generations, and then Reigns bit the hand that fed him when he punched Vince McMahon, and he is going to beat respect into him at Super Showdown. Elias then went to start to write a song, or to recite his song for Shane, and ended up insulting Oklahoma, saying that Texas was better than them, and then they were interrupted by R-Truth rolling into the ring, followed by Drake Maverick and truth was able to suplex him and pin Drake Maverick. And then everyone ganged up on truth who was hit with the drift away and the claymore. And with truth prone on the mat, Elias pinned him to win the 24 seven title. Yeah. His first WWE title. They said that's right. Yes. And Shane then announces a tag match for tonight with Roman reigns and our truth against Elias and McIntyre but he is suspending the 24-7 rule until the main event is over tonight. Mm-hmm. The 23.15-7 uh, <laughs> rule yeah. was in effect tonight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this was all to set up the, the main event and, and the final spot in the, in the whole show. I didn't mind it. I actually like Shane as a heel promo a lot. I think he's fun. The video was just, you know, if, sure, it was impressive, great, whatever. But, you know, obviously, he would make a great manager. It's just odd, I guess, having two wrestlers standing there next to him playing that role, because I think it diminishes the other two. I mean, Elias and Drew, to me, are like basically Singh brothers here. I thought that there was um, 
you know, not to say this 24-7 title is going to do anything. I think that you, you could actually do some fun stuff with if Shane had won this title. Well, he's not – the best in the world is not going to be relegated to the comedy belt, John. Well, that's the problem in and of itself with this title. But having Shane with the two big big guys to protect him and Shane just proclaims himself this this world beater, this champion. I'd much rather it be on someone that's at least pushed than it just be the comedy title reserved for the nobodies. I think the problem is whoever is holding that belt is going to be looked at as a as a comedy guy. Um, like, I think it hurt Elias to win this thing, actually. But, you know, the nature of this belt is that it's it's like, it's the Crash Holly belt. It's, you know, it's like, kind of like the joke belt that nobody really takes seriously. And I feel like Shane, and they probably see Shane as a level certainly way beyond that. He didn't go for the pin in this. I'm hoping we tune in one week. And this title is just forgotten and never referenced again. Our truth is already a great comedy figure, with or without this title, and I don't need another comedy figure two weeks, coming out of this group. Two weeks in, certainly these segments are already like feeling very tiring, um, like very predictable. The thing is, is like I guess you have our truth, who really like you know is good with the belt. How many other people can you see like you know benefit from it? Him and Drake Maverick are it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. And, and, I, don't, and, I, don't, and I don't think it makes a grand change at all to, to the show. It's it's nothing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't even care about, oh, my God, there's a 24-7 title change at the house show in Des Moines. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't like this at the start. This thing has hardly uh, changed my thinking on it. I just think it was it was a poor concept that's been poorly executed. And here we are two weeks in. No one cares about this thing. That's it. Kayla's backstage. Lacey Evans is drinking tea with Charlotte. And they talk about Becky not being man enough to beat her at WrestleMania. And she would still be SmackDown Women's Champion if not for Bailey. And said that Bailey and Becky are crass and classless. And they are going to send Bailey back to the kiddie pool where she belongs. I like- In my rant there, I totally skipped over my, my thought here that what would the odds be, Way, that Goldust would be competing for this title if he were still here? I actually, that would probably be the comparison of where he would be had he not left. I feel like he would is already kind of being shelved, right? Um, like so I he may not even be at the nothing level. He may be below that. I, I really don't know because I can't tell you the last time I've even seen him in a backstage role. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it was due to injury or just like not not them not using him, but he was out with the, the double knee surgery. So he had been out for a while prior to leaving. Yeah. I mean, I, I just don't even know if they would consider him even for something like this. They announced Lars Sullivan against the Lucha House Party in a three-on-one handicap match has been added to Super Showdown that they're promoting as Lars Sullivan's first match. Okay, great. Bailey versus Lacey Evans, another non-title match. Charlotte's on commentary, and she is asked what her and Lacey Evans have in common. They are both classy, and they are from the South. Done. Friendship. Bailey hit an elbow, rolled to the floor, got into Charlotte's face, Evans was in control after the break, took her handkerchief out to wipe herself, and then just dropped it onto Bailey. And then Bailey fought back, sliding drop kick from the floor underneath the turnbuckle, and then she got into Charlotte's face, teased going back into the ring, and then just nailed Charlotte, who then stormed the ring. Evans goes for a roll up. It's countered by Bailey, who pins Lacey Evans, and Bailey wins. Yeah. Uh, I thought Bailey looked. Way more intense than usual, and by having her basically be the one to attack Charlotte first and not waiting for the heel to attack her, I think they're trying to show that she's got a bit more of a mean streak. I mean, they've been doing that for a while, uh, and they're continuing with it. I I think, you know, she's trying really hard right now with the title on her. I thought the match turned out fine, um, but it, to me, didn't really leave that big of an impression because it was just... More of a backdrop just for Charlotte to have a conversation over. So afterwards, frustrated from the loss, Evans shoves Charlotte from behind. And then Charlotte drills her with a kick to the face. 
Bailey's laughing at this. So the friendship lasted two segments between these two and almost felt like you're taking Evans now. Like this almost felt um, very strange to position Lacey Evans, not only losing to Bailey, but then setting her up for a new feud, even though she, as of Monday on Raw, was still doing stuff with Becky Lynch, who doesn't have an opponent beyond Evans right now. So I don't know. It was it just kind of very strange of what was done with Lacey Evans over the course of 24 hours. I didn't see this coming, and I have no idea what it was done for because they're both heels. Um, are you going to do Lacey versus Charlotte right now? And does that mean one of them turns? Um, I was actually looking forward to more tag teams between the two of them. I thought I, I love the idea of putting the tag titles on these two. I think that'd yeah. be a great role for Lacey Evans to be doing tag matches with Charlotte on the road. Yeah. Um, in a much, it's still a pushed role and hardly the spotlight of doing singles matches with Becky. Um, I really like this pairing and they, they had chemistry together and I was disappointed that they did this angle like in a second before you could possibly care about one turning on the other. I know. I, I thought like the chemic, the, the, the gimmicks meshed together really well, like in the same way that, you know, like an IRS and Ted DiBiase might have meshed well together. Um, both enjoying tea and just like kind of like, you know, being classy ladies, bl- tall blondes, whatever. But I, I would have held this off before doing a, a turn first of all to make it more impactful but second to just like prolong the life of this this union and to get more life out of out of like these characters they announced the undertaker will appear on raw monday night in austin texas so it looks like there will be no goldberg before saudi arabia who yeah. would to me be a difference maker on tv for if you announced him for the first time in two years that he'd be on tv um yeah, but it looks like he's just going to show up in next Friday. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a, n- not in this contract. I don't know. Do you feel like this is almost Bill Goldberg is – they don't want to put him into kind of their, their active storylines? Like this is almost just like a one-off match and that's how it's going to be treated? Oh, yeah. That's what it's looking like. I mean that's even what this like Hunter – Orton matches looking like neither have made a TV appearance thus far. We've only got videos, even though both men, I'm sure like I'm sure Hunter's back there. I wonder if Orton's back there, too. So, again, it all feels like, you know, for for these Saudi Arabia shows, they're just kind of like. Elseworlds matches. They've again, I'm I'm going back to, to the Dustin Rhodes thing, but like you can see, like they really do have a hang up when it comes to you reach a certain age. It's like you're just done now. And when you look at where numbers are now, like Goldberg, when he did the um, the second match with Lesnar two years ago at WrestleMania, like he wanted to do more stuff. And they were done after that. And you're telling me that you couldn't have a really compelling program for Goldberg at SummerSlam just to build him up for the summer. And then maybe you phase him out after that. Like to me, he is someone that I'm not saying he's going to uh, drastically increase numbers. But he was a big difference maker when he came back the last time for the Lesnar feud. And I think that the shows, they're desperate for anything. And he would be someone that I would be looking at as a Band-Aid for just a summer program to build up to something for SummerSlam. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's something that they don't want to go to too often because they want to build more of their younger stars. Um, You can also argue, you know, what stars did they make off of Goldberg the last time he was here? Well, he wasn't paired with anyone. He yeah. was paired with Lesnar. So, and obviously with something like this, you're not getting anybody over, I mean, into The Undertaker. So, no. I, I, I think ultimately a move like that, while I think it might be good for the short term, it would be met with the same type of criticism as, you know, anytime that they bring a legend in here. It's a band-aid solution. But I, I pair him with somebody. That's a really interesting matchup. I'm not saying do him and Undertaker at... WrestleMania, but man, even you're, you're telling me Goldberg Roman Reigns is not a match you could do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and maybe they will have those talks, but we also don't know Goldberg's price tag. Well, I think when you're looking at, at your options, um, I don't know. That would be one I'd explore. They showed um, an edited portion of Finn Balor's WWE.com interview from last week, and he talks about 
losing at money in the bank, not being medically cleared last week. And if you watch the full interview, he mid sentence, he just takes his microphone off and like tosses it down and says, can we do this another time? I, I just don't want to do this. And they didn't show that part in, in this, but I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a good promo last week from the, the entire thing. If you watch it, the, the mid interview, Mike taking off and asking to pause or do it another time. That that's always the best. Can, Andrade we, is... can we do this podcast another time, John? Well, if you, if you uh, take your microphone off and just walk off, then I guess we're going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> Finn? Finn? <laughs> All right, I'm back. I'm good. Andrade was backstage. He said he powerbombed Balor onto the ladder, and Finn is going to find his inner demon when he steps up to him at Super Showdown. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Wait, oh, well, I think it's great that he's taking credit for hurting Balor as much. I mean, he's one of, like, four or five men who really hurt Balor. But, okay, I'm glad somebody's taking credit for it. And I think you can really see that Andrade is trying really hard. I think he's shown improvement in his English speaking and his promos. I'm all for giving him a line or two, but they're giving him the entire segment. And it's completely shutting out Zelina Vega, who just stands there and does nothing now. I think. He should be, Andrade should be complimenting Zelina as the main talker. Zelina should be out there doing the Paul Bearer thing. And then, you know, uh, uh, Andrade is Undertaker, basically just coming out and saying a line or two and then rest in peace. Like, that's that's all Andrade should be doing. He shouldn't be taking the whole thing. As it stands right now, I think he's, the way this is being presented, it feels like it's a B-level act. Whereas with Z Zelina Vega talking, it's an A-level act, so... I, I, I understand them wanting, and I understand Andrade wanting, you know, more opportunity to, like, speak English on TV, but I think it's to the detriment of the product as a whole. Main event, R-Truth is coming out. He's hobbling from the attack earlier, and Elias and Drew jump him. Reigns is already in the ring, so he comes to the rescue. Shane is staying away from Reigns. Match begins. They have the heat on R-Truth early. He gets dumped to the floor, and they're just beating him down in the corner. Then he sidesteps. Elias runs into the post. Drew is sent to the floor, and the crowd is rallying behind our truth He's crawling, and he makes the big hot tag. Everyone goes nuts with Roman coming in. He attacks El Elias, knocks Drew off with a Superman punch from the apron, then sends Elias to the floor, who conveniently sets himself up to be hit by the drive-by. Shane gets struck by Reigns, moves as Drew spills onto the desk, missing with the Claymore, and then... Reigns goes into the ring, spears Elias for the win. Big pop for the finish. Yeah, I thought it was another week where you had Roman Reigns tag team match that received a great reaction for Roman's final hot tag. Uh, very successful, I thought. Um, you have a, a baby face that was very symp sympathetic here in R-Truth. So, I, I mean, I thought it was a good TV main event. I thought so, too. The uh, crowd is really into both R-Truth and Reigns. They work together as a team. It was it was fine, like not great, but it was yeah. solid reaction from the from the audience. Good little main event for TV. I thought it was fine, and I thought it received a better reaction than even the the Raw main event between Zayn and uh, I agree, definitely uh, Rollins, yeah. definitely. So Reigns spears Elias a second time, and then he's left laying, and r Truth climbs on top of him and pins him to win the twenty four seven title back as the show ends. I actually thought it was quite clever the way they set everything up, and I thought it set the crowd home happy. Um, so I think that you know, if there's it a was a fine, it was a fine story to do the the suspension, and then the second the match ends, there's Elias. So yeah, it was it was fine. It was good. Yeah, um, you know, the concerns are definitely still there about you know six months from now. Can you? Will this get the same reaction? Will they continue to be able to creatively use the 24-7 title in this way? We wonder. But I, I will say this, to me, was the first instance of like creativity that I found attached to this title. So the bar has been set. <laughs> yes. All right, let's head on, on over to the forum. Tonight's poll, a scale of 1 to 10. Where does this one rank, Way? I thought it, it was beat Raw. It beat Raw for me. Uh, but I still... Like, I didn't, I don't feel like we got, like, many, meh. It just felt like, meh, to me. And maybe that's because of the pay-per-view that's coming up. 
Maybe it's just a, the lack of like like movement and storylines for the women. Um, I'm gonna have to go five and a half. I went six. Five point nine. Five point eight two. We're getting votes as we speak. Five point eight two. All right. So there you go. Some some really solid ratings this week from uh, Raw and SmackDown, uh, but this did beat Raw. Paul from New Jersey writes. Perhaps it was because Raw was atrocious, but I found SmackDown to be a pretty solid show. Kofi and Owens was an enjoyable match, and Bailey was booked strong. What a concept. Why would Truth need to defend his title? More importantly, poor Elias. Some can say their first WWE championship was the illustrious Intercontinental title, but Elias now walks 24-7. I'm tired of Shane McMahon's face, but I thought Brian and Rowan were great as well. As well as Black. And he gives us a 6 out of 10. Okay, let's be honest here. Is... The current incarnation of the IC championship that much more prestigious than this twenty four seven title? Um, uh, barely, barely. Who's the Intercontinental Champion right now? Finn Balor. Finn Balor, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. We go to Brandon from New Jersey. I got him two days in a row. My dearest Canadian Tar Sands, it is I, your loyal Crown Prince of cra- Crime, Brandon. Been a minute since we spoke. I quite frankly have been missed. Would love to apologize for being framed. I didn't commit. I didn't graffiti your wiki, John. I would never be a rebel rouser and do such untold things. Alas, we are here for the meat of the email. That is Smackdown. Fun show. Day two of the revolution lived up to expectations, which produced more wrestling than Monday. Owens and the Dreadlock Dynamo had a great match. So did Mandy and Karn. You wrote the Dreadlock Domino. Oh, Domino. In order to make Raw better again, we have to go back to Johnny and Way to actually move forward. We have to go back Johnny and Way to actually move forward. Now, I don't mean to reminisce and chase ghosts. I mean, go back and see where Raw came from. Where you been? How you got there? And see where you are going. I know there are those who say that you can't go back. Yes, you can. You just have to look in the right place. Meanderings. John, are you going to build a fight finder? Nope. No, that's way too big of an undertaking for me to ever possibly consider. Okay. 100% no. Uh, Let's just go here to Joe from Niagara. (laughs) Hey, guys. I have to be honest. It's been a struggle watching Raw and SmackDown this week after watching Double or Nothing. I'm sure that is a general consensus. All I can say about SmackDown is that I feel bad for Kevin Owens. Where does he go from here? Just wondering if you guys will be at the Niagara Falls Comic Con this year. Hopefully The Undertaker makes it there, although I'm a little worried with Super Showdown just two days prior to his scheduled appearance. Anyway, boys, keep up the good work. No, we will not be at the Niagara Falls Comic Con. That's actually a, like a really busy weekend because there is the Super Showdown Friday. Saturday night, there's a big UFC. And then Sunday is Dominion. So it's a lot of shows that weekend. So we will not be going to the Niagara Falls Comic Con. But if you are... Uh, please send us a report if uh, The Undertaker is there and you happen to uh, attend. Uh, there's going to be a number of wrestling personalities there. But The Undertaker is obviously the big one. Cool. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for the feedback. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, is there anything else to go over with? I don't think so. I got to watch Thunder in Paradise. Oh, God. Well, I have to finish Thunder in Paradise. Uh, there's nothing about this that is... Uh, well, the highlight are the cameos that you can find of Hulk Hogan's pals he got roles in this movie for. So you can check that out. Uh, are we going to have an announcement on Monday, Way? Monday, yes. Yes. Um, an announcement. Yeah. Uh, Monday. Okay, Monday. Monday we will have a post-wrestling announcement. So look forward to that. Uh, In the meantime, everyone, go check out postwrestling.com, postwrestlingcafe.com. We're going to be back on Wednesday. We'll have the Jason King interview up on the cafe, new British wrestling experience, and then Wednesday night, it's John and Way. Once again, fourth straight night, it's the double shot. Get ready. It'll be fun. Goodbye.